Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's session to cover a lot about AI. And I have a wonderful guest with me today, and I'm excited to showcase really the revolutionary technology that we offer and how it applies to AI and the different ways that you can use AI within your business. So we're really excited to showcase uh, the overall concept of AI. As we all know, we've been hearing about AI for months and months, if not years now, and we want to be able to understand a little bit more of how we can leverage that. So today we're going to discuss how to develop a more accurate forecast, specifically with AI. So it's very targeted to more of the finance group, but AI, of course, can be leveraged across the organization in different ways, and we'll definitely dive into a lot more details in that in today, our today's discussion. Before I go through and introduce my panelist today, Henry, what I want to do is I want to go over a little bit of today's agenda and what we're going to be covering to get everyone really excited about today's topic. The first thing that we're going to start with is really to cover the real life use cases that we have seen so far and how other organizations are leveraging AI in today's world. Then we're going to go into really more of an observation state to understand how are other organizations leveraging AI specifically around the forecasting category and ultimately leading to a point of getting the organization to adopt AI but have the confidence that it's going to drive the business forward. We use this phrase here at Xterra very commonly within conversations with other companies that we deal with, and that is trust but verify. What that means is we want to be able to trust what the AI model has created for us, but we always need to verify with that human element, and we'll go into more discussions today about that. Then we're going to go into a little bit more about cash flow forecasting. As I mentioned earlier, AI could be used across the organization for a variety of different use cases, but today we're going to focus on more of the cash flow forecasting side and really in tune this algorithm into your business and make your life a lot easier and ultimately making teams more productive. And that is all leveraging physics, the concept of physics. And Henry's going to get into a little bit more detail uh, around how this works and how we can apply it to our businesses on a day-to-day -day basis. Last but not least, we're going to talk about the augmented residual forecast and what does that mean specifically for your business and how can you implement this at your organization. If you stay with us until the very end, we do have a challenge that we're going to introduce for everyone asking for you to bring data to us so we can run it through our forecasting engine and provide you that level of output so you can verify the accuracy of that forecast knowing that it won't be perfect because there's other factors that will play a role into that mix. So we're really excited today to, to cover this whole AI concept and how it relates to cash flow forecasting. So thank you again for joining us. Without further ado, I want to get into our presenters for today. So I'll just give you a brief introduction of myself. So my name is Mike Zach. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Axteris, and I've been with the company for about two and a half years now. Prior to Actaris, I was actually in the treasury management space where I met Henry, who I will uh, position in in just a moment. Treasury management is uh, software is really a technology that allows organizations to consolidate all of their banking transactions into a single source of truth. I did this with large corporations, hedge funds, private equity firms at a variety of different companies, came over to Actaris, like I said, two and a half years ago to really understand the other side of the business and how it relates across the organization. So really excited to be here today. I'm going to hand it over to Henry to quickly give a brief introduction to himself, and then we'll go ahead and begin. Hi, so I'm Henry Wong. I've been uh, in industry with Mike for probably about 22 years now. Some of you um, on the call today will know me from the treasury space. Um, I've been a product manager. I've run development teams. I've been a VP of data science. Um, and today we're, we'll talk a little bit about uh, introducing AI and uh, deep learning models and machine learning models to, to forecasting. Awesome. Thank you, Henry. And really today, we want to be able to cover a wide spectrum of the concept of AI. We want to understand the preliminary use cases and how we can apply this on a day-to-day -day basis. But we also want to get into the details of really understanding how AI works and how we can apply that. If we understand the details of the granularity of AI, it allows us to come up with these use cases and apply this logic to that. So some of this will be very technical, 
In other cases, it'll be more business focused. So we're trying to cover a wide spectrum here with the wonderful audience that we have. So let's start with some basics. What are some real life use cases that we have seen over the last year or so be implemented leveraging AI? And there's a lot of these that we can certainly talk about, but I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna hone in on just a few today. The first one, a convenience store that we worked with. Very, very large convenience store. And they came to us with a very simple challenge that they were trying to solve. And they wanted to be able to leverage AI because their, their owners and their executive team was pushing this down. What we did was we analyzed their business problem first, which was they had the ability to open new stores. And they wanted to expand into other regions that they weren't in today. Instead of them going through the normal process of, go, of going to the internet, looking at what land is available, uh, researching certain things, there's a lot of information that you have to pull together to pick a site location that will be the most optimal for that convenience store. What we ended up doing for them was we cross-referenced all of their internal historical data that they had across all of their different stores. We started with understanding what makes a store profitable and what are the reasons why that store is profitable? And that's external reasons. Is it close to an intersection? Is it close to a church or a school? Is it on a corner somewhere? Is it next to a Walgreens? Things like that. Ultimately being able to understand where these profitable stores are located and what makes them so profitable from an external perspective. From there, by leveraging historical internal data that's only available to this firm, we then went to the external data, understanding what land was, the, was available and up for sale, where, what location is this in, what's the demographics of this location. And we're able to take all of this valuable internal and external data, merge it together, and allow then AI to learn from this model and this data and smartly predict where the most optimal place would be based on their criteria. Of course, there were some different iterations that we went through, gathered some additional feedback from the broader team that has been doing this on a more manual basis for many, many years. And what they were able to do is they were able to easily click on a button that pulled up a list. So if they selected what region they wanted to be in, let's say, I'll pick on Henry here because he's in Canada, in Vancouver, let's say that they wanted to expand into Vancouver. They would type that in, it would pull all of the relevant information, the external information related to Vancouver, as well as all their internal information that we can leverage. AI learned from that and was able to identify the top 10 sites that they can narrow in and focus their human attention on and ultimately land on that uh, site and build from there. So it was a great initiative that we performed with them just to really optimize their site selection process. So that's the first real life use case by leveraging AI and being able to pull in all that historical data to find that most optimal location. The next paint producer. When we think about any paint producer that you're familiar with today, it doesn't matter who it is. We worked with one of the largest and they had the, they had the notion that they wanted to be able to understand trends. We all know that trends change periodically from a, from a paint standpoint. There are different colors that go in and out every single year. And they wanted to be able to pick out what they believe the newest trends are going to be for that year. Because if you think about it from a paint distribution standpoint, they have to pre-mix this paint. And if they pre-mix this paint, they're already going full into that, which means that if this does not sell, it's a sunk cost for them. It's they have to get rid of it because ultimately it's already mixed, pre-mixed. So what we ended up doing for them was taking a lot of external internet information to find out what are the most common trends, what colors are people talking about, and marry this up with their internal data to understand what's their mixing process, what's their distribution process, how much do they typically mix on a given basis, and what's the, the loss that they have seen in the past and just learn from mistakes. I think as humans, we do this naturally. We learn from our failures and we get better and better over time. Well, an AI model works very similar in that case where you wanna feed it as much data as you possibly can and it learns from that data and will give you that primary output. 
So with them, we were able to accurately predict what we believe the newest trend in color is going to be. So they were able to then communicate this information back to their distribution team so they can finalize how much of this they're actually going to distribute out to the various store locations. So very, very profitable. And they were able to see a significant increase in the demand of their uh, products, as well as a significant reduction in the loss of their products, meaning that they didn't have to throw any of this in, uh, paint away or get rid of it at a cheaper cost. The third example, real life example that we have is a distributor. Now you can kind of take the same concept and either apply it to your business or tweak this uh, using your imagination a little bit. But think about a distributor and all the different items and things that go into distributing data, uh, distributing products from one side of the country to another side of the country, and then throw that into one, um, one country to another country. The idea here is that we wanted to be able to optimize the shipping components of this company's products. I'm going to use a hypothetical uh, locations because I don't want to disclose the exact locations that we worked with. But let's say that there was um, material located in the Philippines and they needed to get that material to the United States. What they wanted to do is they wanted to understand what the most optimal shipping route was, not necessarily what's the quickest way to get to the States in this example, it's the most optimal way. And what we were able to do is using external data is feed a model, an algorithm, that, such as current, current trends, like for the ocean, weather patterns was extremely important in this endeavor. What is the quickest route? Is it better to go north or south, warm water, cold water? These are some of the factors that us as humans, when we're thinking about forecasting, we wouldn't even consider because it's too much data for us to comprehend and put into a model manually to figure out what that most optimal route was. Well, if we're taking all this information and being able to bring it into a single source of truth, we now have the ability to leverage algorithms to compute the exact requirements of that optimal route for each of the locations. And also keep in mind that these change. It's not just going from one location to another location. Weather patterns change, currents change within the water. Right? So a lot of these factors are also taking historical patterns of what the weather was over this time period. So then they can predict, well, in June or in September, it's going to be different because last year, June and September was completely different. And that's our best guess. And then of course you start to use real data that starts to come in and that just fine tunes the model even further and it just learns over time. AI is not an easy button. It's not something where you can say, okay, click a button, everything gets distributed and we have the most accurate forecast. It needs to learn over time. ChatGPT came out in November of 2023, I believe. If I'm, if Henry, am I correct on that? Is it 2023 that ChatGPT came out or is that 2022? I'm, I'm going to be wrong on that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> one. One way or the other, it's relatively new compared to a lot of the other tools that are out there. The idea here is that ChatGPT has been learning for many, many years before the actual product came to production. So you have to be able to allow time to learn, for the system to learn from all this historical data, and it just gets better and better, kind of like a fine wine. So I have three other examples that I just want to quickly run through here. And I think it just helps kind of with the initial process that we're going through with this webinar is really get the people thinking on, well, how could I use AI leveraging these use cases that Mike is coming up with? How can I use this within my business? And that's what we ultimately want to get to with everyone on this call today is, can you relate to some of these or are there individual instances that you can think of that we could help you with? And you could provide data and we could use our forecasting engine to be able to accommodate some of those uniquenesses to help optimize your forecast as well. Healthcare, very, very common use case that we see is being able to leverage healthcare data to, for, for labor scheduling, for outpatient or inpatient optimization. When we think of a hospital, we typically want to make sure that it's, it's well run. And we have people that are coming in and going out at the same time, and we're optimizing that window. 
Well, for healthcare, you have a lot of moving parts. You have your nurses, you have the scheduling of those nurses, you have your patients, and you obviously can't predict that someone's going to get injured, but you can use external data to help drive what you believe is going to happen and staff accordingly. So looking at accidents, looking at death rates, some, something along those lines. You want to be able to bring all this historical data so that way you as a business can optimize your resources internally and also increase customer satisfaction. Because the last thing that people want to do, and we've all been there, walking into a hospital, having to wait for hours just to get into a room and see a doctor. We want to have, we want to create a more unique experience for patients as well as for nurses and everyone is aligned based on this. So a lot of quality data that sits out there that is, that isn't typically used within our forecasting models. But now the, with the power of AI and the accessibility of AI, we can actually bring all this data in and be able to marry that up with your internal data to provide that, that viewpoint. Inflation. We've all experienced this over the last year or so, high inflation numbers, which impact not only us as consumers, but from, from a business standpoint as well. And we want to be able to understand what is this like? Is this an anomaly? Or has this happened in the past? Or can we, what are the, what are the different levers that have been pulled to get us to this point? And if this happens again in the future, what is it that we need to do as a business to protect ourselves from high inflation? All of the inflation numbers going back to the, the 1900, you know, being able to ultimately take that information in and have the system learn. As humans, we're not going to go year by year, quarter by quarter and understand inflation numbers, calculate that, and then try to figure out how that integrates with our core internal data. All of this can now be automated by feeding these machines this level of detail and then also marrying that up with your internal data to tell a complete story and to help. We're not here saying that AI is going to replace people. It's not going to. We need to get to a point where we're leveraging AI to make sure that we are more productive as humans and as well as we have more output that we can generate so we can drive the business forward. And that's exactly what AI is. I really, really like Microsoft's nickname for their AI engine, which is Copilot. When you think about that and you break that word down, well, you wouldn't fly a plane without a co-pilot. You want someone there as backup. And that's the exact way that I think about AI is that it's there for backup. It's there for help when you need it. It's there to make you more productive and, and to showcase that you're leveraging a lot of information to make this decision. And then you can trust that information after you've gone through that verification process. And then the last but not least example, and then I'm going to hand it over to Henry to see if he has any uh, insights into what I've covered so far, if he wants to add anything in addition to what I've talked about. Fraud detection. This is very common in insurance, in banking, uh, of course, it's uh, across all organizations in different departments. Being able to understand patterns. That's another powerful tool that AI can bring to the table is analyze a, a huge subset of data and identify if there's any anomalies in that data. For example, I always go to the same store every single week. And maybe one-off case, I charge something on my credit card with a completely different store. Well, that's, that's adhering to a different pattern in my payment history or my credit card history. You want to be able to be notified of that. We, we see this from a consumer standpoint. I'm sure all of us have been to a, at a, in a situation where the bank sends us a text message or they call us and say, is this a fraud transaction? Well, what they're using is they're using AI to understand what the patterns of these transactions are. And is this an anomaly? And we can use this across the board. We can use this for suppliers. We can use this for vendors, for payment. Just making sure that we have that co-pilot, that assistant that's helping us look through this data on top of what we look through to see if we've missed anything. Because as humans, there's always human error in things that we do. And this is just an added component that allows us to be more comfortable with the decisions that we make. So I hope you felt that this was helpful and ultimately gets you to a point of uh, taking these use cases may not be the exact use cases that you would leverage today, but hopefully it opens your eyes in the different ways that you can leverage AI for your business. And then we'll talk about the challenge a little bit later in today's discussion. But Henry, I wanted to give you a chance here. Uh, obviously you've seen a lot of other use cases yeah. as well, but does this align with what you've seen or anything, any feedback that you want to give? 
Yeah, so by way of example, I think what I'm going to do, um, if you could dial back to the slide that just comes right before this one. Um, so first of all, I'm going to say, man, you can riff. Like that was, that's going to be hard to follow. <laughs> uh, I'll try. So I'm going to make a, a brief comment on each of these examples, and I'm going to keep it super brief, like one sentence, which is uncommon for me. But for a convenience store, doing things like finding locations, you probably want to put demographic factors in there. And um, so we we do um, we worked on an engine that's able to do that. You you can take vast amounts of data, um, and at the training stage, you can inform this model um, by telling it things about geography, and then it'll know these things about geography. Then you put the problem towards okay, I've got a, a series of stores, and I want to put one here, um, or suggest where I should put one. With the paint mix, the idea of primary colors and mixed colors, there's also the idea that the um, there's distribution. Uh, pieces in the in the supply chain that also include cash, right? So you have to invest. Um, there's an obvious optimization there. One um, differentiator that I will make is there, there's a difference between math-heavy type AIs and, and language-heavy AIs. The language ones have become very popular recently, um, and it's great. The, the language ones are leading the charge, and because they boil down to probability matrices anyway um, at the core, uh, there's, there's lots to be learned from them. Um, Distribution, I don't think we need to cover because we already talked a bit about that. So if we go to the next slide, there. Yeah, there so in the, the healthcare industry, um, I think right now has uh, a very, very large uh, optimization problem with, with uh, marshalling resources, as you said. The inventories of equipment and uh, supplies are a big part of that. Uh, but also the scheduling of staff, and I think he talks about that. There, there are time series and mathematical properties there that can that lend themselves to to machine learning, um, and and even deep learning, which is something uh, we'll differentiate in the later slide. Um, inflation, I'm not going to touch that one. I live in Vancouver; everything's expensive. Uh, fraud detection, <laughs> we're yeah. So in in terms of de detecting what might be a, a, a um, uh, fraudulent transaction in the pattern of normal things. That That's something that uh, is more and more common for algorithms to attempt to do. When you get to the more advanced levels, there are specialist companies that will do uh, fraud detection. So uh, that, that's actually quite an um, ambitious thing uh, to do if it's if um, not normal is, is very complex as compared to normal. Anyway, th those are the comments I wanted to make. Um, maybe we could, if, yeah, I think you have one more slide before, before my... Yeah, and yeah, and one one thing that I want to point out that I the one word obviously you said a lot of valid information, but the one word that stuck out the most for me was the word train. I think that's the the overlooked word that a lot of people don't consider when thinking about AI. That you have to train this model. It's not just this black box of information that can predict everything in the world. I mean, if someone comes up with that, I think they would be one of the richest people in the world. But the idea is you want to get to a point where you have quality data and that you're training this model, this AI engine with that quality data. So it's always coming back to garbage in, garbage out, not only with your internal data, but it also consists with external data. So there's always that challenge, but getting to a point where you're training the model based on your unique business criteria. When we think about the different categories, there's a lot of categories in AI. Uh, we're not even going to be able to scratch the surface in, in talking about this today. But some of the things related to forecasting specifically that we get involved with, one of them is data augmentation. Well, as I mentioned earlier, garbage in, garbage out. You have to get to a point where the quality of the data is increasing exponentially as we're feeding it into that model, or we're starting with at least a good base. Now, when we think about data augmentation, right, changing of data or updating of data or enhancing enriching data, it's all about data prep. We know that we have information in a lot of disparate systems. We have to be able to get it all into a single source of truth, normalized across these various systems, such as HR systems, CRM solutions, ERP systems. And when you think about all these platforms, they all speak different languages. When we bring it into a single source of truth, we need to make sure that we normalize that data. So prepping it and making sure that it's interconnected, but having AI do these matches for us without us having to go in and say, well, this is connected to this, and this is connected to this, because that's more of the, the old world that we used to live in. Data completion. There's a lot of data that comes from these systems that we may not 
ultimately have. Like, uh, there's a lot of examples that I can give here, but I'll give you one that I deal with on a day to day basis. Now, when we're in our CRM tool, there's sometimes items that I just don't know. Like, for example, I don't know the employee count at a business. I don't know, or the, I don't know where, what the address of that business is. Like some of these things may not be as important, but ultimately when you have data and you have something that's learning from that data, all information is relevant. Well, there's things that can really feed into a CRM to help with that data completion. And so with AI, it's important to pull all this external data. Think of this even from a vendor standpoint. Vendors, addresses change, phone numbers change. We don't want someone to have to go through a list of your vendors every single quarter and go manually out to the internet and say, okay, well, did this vendor change or call someone to see? Why not have an AI model that actually goes out and does this for you automatically? There's already great resources, Google, LinkedIn, that we can verify this data and make sure that it's the most accurate. Matching and reconciliation. This has always been a pain point for a lot of organizations, setting up rules, doing individual manual matches. Well. The reason why we had to set up rules in the first place and we had to continue to maintain those rules is because we wanted to speed up the process of reconciliation. The problem without AI is that when there is an exception, meaning there's a transaction that came in that we did not anticipate and we match that transaction or we create a rule, we have to maybe do it again the next time it comes in or it, it, the system isn't learning from itself and can't identify or pre-identify that we believe this transaction should be actually assigned to this category. You want at least a point of saying, yes, I agree, or no, I don't agree, and then be able to change that. But if you're dealing with thousands and thousands of transactions on a daily basis, you want someone, a co-pilot here, to go through and match all these things for you and learn from your input, your feedback. That's a huge component with AI. It's not just having a complete data for you. It's learning from a human to make sure that it gets smarter and smarter over time. We do this all the time in our day-to-day -day lives. We tell someone to do something and in hopes that when we tell them to do it a certain way, that they do it the next time the same way. Well, we're training that person to do this over and over again, but they're not just going to do it willy-nilly without any type of guidance. And then decision support. We want to be able to have confidence in where these matches are coming up or this, this data is being completed, right? There's a lot of information out on the internet. We just need to understand, well, is this accurate or not accurate? What's the confidence that this model has related to this data? So that's kind of just the, the data augmentation side. So enriching your data, consolidating your data, getting all this information into a single source of truth so it can start to learn off of this framework. Once we have that foundation built, now we get into using AI with insights. I want to be able to query my data. Well, what was my revenue this year? How does it compare to last year? We have all these questions that we come up with ourselves and we get asked on a day-to-day -day basis. And it would be great to use natural language to query a large data set without us having to build reports or build Excel templates to find that answer. We want to be able to use these machines to our advantage where we just ask it a very simple question and it provides us that visibility and then we can verify that if needed, if it doesn't look right. We all know our business inside and out. And for the most part, we can determine if our revenue is 100 billion versus 10 billion. Like there's, there's a big difference there and we can kind of verify it with, uh, you know, just kind of taking a little bit of a glance. Anomaly detection. This is a very, very big concept in the market that we're dealing with right now is I want to be able to see, well, what's, what's my delta and what are the anomalies, things that have happened that I may not have even noticed in my data set because I'm too worried about copy and pasting data, putting reports together. I don't have time to analyze this information. So I want someone, an assistant to go through and analyze it for me, providing the outputs and I can then tweak from there to see what's important and what's not important, what I'm presenting. Uh, and then cluster analysis. I'm going to skip over that for now just because we um, have only 30 minutes left and still a lot more to cover and a lot more information for us to share. But the last category, and then I'll hand it over to Henry see if he has any comments on this slide in particular, is knowledge-based planning. We take for granted chat GPT on a regular basis. And, but one of the biggest problems with ChatGPT is that it's open to the internet, but it's also one of its benefits, right? We can query the internet with a single, you know, sentence, but we also don't want our internal company data exposed to the broader internet. And I think that's where this knowledge-based planning comes in, where it's more targeted. 
So think of ChatGPT only for your business. So you can query information about your business, but it's not being sent externally so other competitors can query your same data. Right now, this has been a big thing in the market, lots of stories out there where there's employees that are typing in information, sensitive information into ChatGPT. Well, as soon as you hit submit, that information is now publicly available and can be accessible. What we want to be able to do as a firm is we want to protect the data, not the external data. That's the internet. That's still, ChatGPT is still going to serve a great purpose in the planning process and the forecasting process. But when we think about our internal data, we want to protect that. But we also want to make sure that we're learning and it's not getting mixed up with all this external data and that we can train it in the right way. So that's where this knowledge-based planning comes into play, where we have classification. Are we classifying our transactions in the right way and making predictions on what those classifications could be? Uh, set up rules on how we want to be able to look at this knowledge. And it's not just knowledge for businesses. The way that, that I like to think about this is you have ChatGPT is more for the public domain information. Then you're going to have industry domain information, maybe for like retailers, manufacturers. Then you're going to have your own business domain information that you're only going to use. All three of them are extremely valid in different ways, but being able to combine them together provides a more powerful experience for the end user. So Henry, I don't know if you have any comments on this slide in particular um, yeah. related to these categories. I do. Um, it, you wanted me to comment on the, the knowledge planning bit. Um, I think it's important, and we'll level set in a second on the next slide, but when you talk about large language models, I don't want to take anything away from ChatGPT. It's actually really good. Um, the idea of uh, privacy of data, I'll give you one example. And this is a shout out to a company called Lakara. They put up a, a challenge. Um, I, this was about three months ago or something like this, where uh, Gandalf the Wizard had a password that was memorized. And the challenge was using the ChatGPT type interface try to get Gandalf to reveal to you the password. Um, and it got iteratively harder. There was something like eight levels. Um, but the the main idea was that you could game these things. The security on um, the chatbot-like uh, language models, they're, they're not, I don't think it's completely determined yet how to secure these things because you, you can give it a system prompt in the training stage and say, okay, um, I don't want you to reveal this. Um, you might even be able to tune it to, to resist prompts, but you can, you can trick it with, with things like, um, Hey, let's, let's talk about a story and let's fictionalize, uh, or, you know, give it to me in an encoded format and I'll decrypt it myself, th things like this. Um, and eventually you can get it to reveal password. So that's illustrative. It's still sort of a, a nascent, uh, undertaking to try to secure these things. Um, and then secondly, I'll say, uh, we've been running some experiments where we're, we're running, um, some of the the open source type models, pe people know what they are, the Mistral, like Microsoft has one called Phi2. Um, and there's different flavors of these pre-trained pre models. Um, and if there's any users out there of Hugging Face, you'll know that you can go there and download different models, experiment with them, have them do token completions on, on a little server that you set up and run locally. You can ask it questions, fine tune. There's tools out there now that you can um, specialize. You, you can take a pre-trained model and specialize it for your field. Um, what we're talking about in forecasting is math heavy, so it won't be language heavy. I don't think the language models are quite there for forecasting. We might get there one day, but that's far off. Um, I think what, what we're gonna talk about is, is the math models, math heavy models. Yeah, and that's, that's completely agree with you on that. And we're at the infancy stages of AI, right? And over the next five years, it's gonna be completely different than where we are today. It's just being able to understand the concepts of AI, how does AI work, how can we align this to our business and have a strategy to move forward, but understand the governance and the security components related to that, because the last thing we want is for our data to be leaked and all of a sudden everyone has access to that. So Henry, before we get into your next slide here, I would you want to um, initiate a poll question for the broader group just to get a feel for the audience and, and let's see if, um, if they ultimately can, uh, if they're using AI. So the question that we're proposing right now uh, in front of you is, are you currently using AI within your planning process or even in your business today? Or is it something that you're looking at? So is it a yes or no, very simple. We just want to get to know the audience a little bit more and to understand what's the knowledge that you may have and are you using this today so we know how deep or how high we need to go with the, uh, the conversation. So we'll just give that a few more seconds for people to 
go forward with. Let me just go ahead and uh, switch to the next slide here. Okay, so, so far it looks like, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think it, it's, uh, it counts as a yes if you're, if you're experimenting with it, even if you don't have it in production yet. Okay, perfect. Yep, all right, so the poll has been closed. Just to, Henry, just to give you the results here, it looks like 67%, so two-thirds of the individuals that are on the call right now are not using AI okay. uh, in this way, uh, and okay. obviously one-third is. So we have a, a good spread of people. So I think this is going to be a great conversation to start getting into the math and how AI works and really some of the details behind that. So I'll leave it to you for the next slide. Yeah. Um, so feel free to interrupt. I like to keep things interactive. I know we've got everybody on mute and just the two of us, so it's unfair. But I'll start off by being a Canadian quoting an American. So I'm going to quote Eisenhower. And it, he, so he said, in preparing for battle, I've always found that plans are useless, but planning is in, indispensable. And the core value of that point is you need to constantly be planning and you're going to get close. At least you're going to have a direction that's going to get you close to the result you want, but that's probably never going to happen. You're never going to be 100% right. Um, in a machine learning context, if you train an AI to be 100% right on your training data, that's all it'll get. Right? It's going to think that the exercise is to always just repeat the training data. It's a rote learning thing, and um, you'll hear a term called overfitting, uh, overtraining, um, that, and that's what it refers to. But before um, we get our ambitions all the way to let's automate everything, I think 40% of the goal with AI is to know... Um, to set, to set the right goal, right? Like, do you really want to take processes that you've taken decades and company and institutional knowledge to develop um, and probably generations of people in some cases and just throw that all out and assume that you can have a magical AI that can go in and solve everything, right? So in as much as you, you could probably do that with small tasks, um, you probably don't want to do it with something as important as forecasting right off the bat. Um, so making this assumption that you can supplant existing processes and, and people um, with institutional knowledge that will contribute to um, what might be a 60 to 80% good forecast today. You, you probably don't want to do that. You want to keep the, the good 60 or 80% and then try to forecast the rest, right? Le leave the hard job to the AI and, and let's train it until it, gets it um, uh, until it gets it done well. Now, you in the early stages, you might want to experiment and see how far we can get with a good model. Um, and then compare that and then decide how much you, you really want to forecast before you bring it into production or rely on it. But that, So that's one part caveat. Um, second, uh, the second part of that is actually setting direction. So I think it's very important for a company to decide what level of AI knowledge they want before they attempt a project. Do you want to be a PhD data scientist before you even start so that you understand everything about it? Or... Um, do you want to know absolutely nothing about it and be a consumer that just, uh, you know, I've used ChatGPT at home, so therefore now I'm going to start a project and then end up relying on it for my forecast. That's the, so both of those are sort of at the extreme. I think it's important for an organization to decide how much they want to know and how much they want to um, forego and, and let the AI take on. And so this decision is quite important because it will set the tone for almost everything you do. Now, the good news is the more you jump into this stuff, the, the better you'll get and the, the more you'll know, um, just like anything else, right? And that, that happens um, in organizations where there, there um, is the freedom to be in, uh, interested in things and, and to take them far. So personally, I'll share with you a bit of my experience. I started tuning large language models a couple of months ago, and it was a deep dive. I have some data science training, but it was very different from what we learned. Um, the The concept of taking a neural network and training it, um, most of us aren't going to have the, the budget to do that at a, at a credible level, right? So if you're open AI, you can, you can do that. Um, but what you can do is take the very last mile of it and do this thing called tuning. There's, there's processes that you can, you, can, um, you can essentially bias language models to give you the next token that's more related to the specialty that you trained it on than what it was generally trained on. Okay, so this is a good thing. Um, however, we're talking about math models today. We're not talking about language models. But there is inspiration to be taken from that. Because when you look at a prompt or a paragraph that you send to one of these language models, all it's really doing is looking at everything that came before, coming out with the next token. The next token is a word in this case, right? It might be a character one day, but it's, it's a word. And then it's taking everything that you gave it before plus that word and coming out with the next one. You can more or less do that with forecasting. Um, but the good news is you can also interject that first token with institutional knowledge, 
Right? So, so hang on to that, and, and I'll uh, talk about the next 30%. Right, so what was that? That was 10 minutes for the first point. I'll, uh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll quicken it a little bit here. So the other 30% is you want processes that are repeatable once you cement them in place. So do a lot of hard work to make sure that it's reliable, but then uh, make it repeatable. Don't do this thing where, where you, um, you know, I'll give you one use case. Okay, I'm going to audit my code. Uh, I'm going to use this chat GPT to do that. I'm just going to paste it in. Whatever comes out, I'm going to use it. Well, it might run. It might execute, but it might have change something or misinterpreted something and and that's not a good way to to code now i think for the experienced chat gpt user you, you could uh um do very well you, you can amplify your um especially the the grunt level stuff that that is really um it, it's just a function of time you you can speed up doing that um in terms of forecasting i think it's going to take a little bit more work than that and i'll and i'll say if your data is very good and very informative and has inherent in the the time frame that you gave it and the interval that you select to forecast and how many intervals forward that you want to forecast. If, you, if those things are all good, you're going to get a pretty good forecast if you use the method that we talk about um, a little bit later. Um, but there, there, is, uh, there is a scenario where you give it incomplete data and get a, get a bad prediction, right? So um, you, you want to make things, sure that uh, things are repeatable, but robust before you, you start to repeat them. And then finally, choose technology that works, right? So temper your ambition to not... Um, you know, I don't like the term boil the ocean, right? But I'll use it. The, so don't try to boil the ocean because you can always boil it later, right? You, you can start off at a level where you upscale your technology um, and your knowledge and then get it to work. This is very different than going to a vendor, relying on that vendor to tell you 100% of, and just trusting them and then handing over your data and then, and then having it done. It's a very participative uh, process. You, you talked about training earlier. There's things that are endemic to um, your organization that will be different than others, and those are, those are the nuances that you have to build into um, a model. They're not they're not uh, one size fits all. In terms of forecasting, though, in the math heavy models, there are a lot of things that that are um, sort of one size fit, fits all. And you talked about a lot of use cases where um, if you're forecasting inventory or, or things like capacity management. Uh, capacity utilization, um, cash, these things, when you have a time series, there are usually patterns or, um, you know, uh, uh, cyclical things that you, you can track and, and use as tools to predict um, the next the next interval. Do you have any uh, dialogue from you there? Yeah, no, no and, and essentially kind of to summarize what I believe everything that you were, you were kind of mentioning there is you want to be able to, you know, set your goal and and get to a point of what do you think is going to be a quick win? You're not going to be, like you said, boiled. You're not going to be able to boil the ocean in the, in the beginning stages. So kind of use this as a, a crawl, walk, walk, run type of yeah. exercise. Now, there was a great question that came in that I want to address real quick, and then I'll hand it back to you, Henry. Uh, it's, is ChatGPT the recommended AI tool for finance and forecasting? It's a, it, and the answer is it depends, but I'll elaborate. ChatGPT is great for public knowledge. Let's say I'm a bicycle manufacturer and I want to understand what bicycles are, what's the increased demand, consumer demand going to be or predicted based on all of the internet data that's out there. That's great because it's all publicly available. It's not great when you're trying to figure out what your internal forecasts are based on actual data. ChatGPT, if you were to feed it your actual data, now everyone has the availability to your data. That's where I, we would recommend something like Copilot or independent AI models that we create, where it stays within your four walls, that level of data. But that does not mean that you can't bring those two different data sources together to have a complete picture. So ChatGPT is great for querying basic questions, um, formatting certain things, but knowing that that is public information, you want to be able to have more control, more privacy, more governance related to your internal data. And that's why we would leverage you know, custom models or even Copilot, which is going to be a phenomenal tool to use within the Microsoft ecosystem. Do you have any comments on that, Henry? Yeah, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'm going to, I'll repeat a, a little bit. There, you have language heavy and the math heavy, right? So they haven't converged yet, in, in my opinion. But I think if you're focusing on micro math in, in your organization, you should use something that's, that's math heavy, do a prototype that's going to be understandable to you. So you know variously what it's doing and then uh, use it to get a successful result and then understand it a little bit more and then, and then modify it, train it a bit more and let it get better. 
that's very different than taking your data, throwing it to chat GPT and say, hey, I'm going to ask you a, a linguistic level type of question. Hey, do a forecast for me. Tell me what's going to happen in the future. That, that might not be the best way to do it. Um, I'm tempted to, to sort of uh, talk about the structure of a, a large language model and how it works and why it wouldn't work with a forecast, but I'm not going to do it. Um, we, we could do that in an, another session. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And it's actually, I would love to do another poll question because I think this will lead nicely into the next slide that we have is really understanding from the broader group that we have with us today. Is there anything, is there any one thing that you would like to forecast with AI? And the choices are your cash, inventory, demand, uh, capacity utilization, like resource management, or is there a different example? Uh, and if you do have a different example, we would love to hear what those examples are, and we can start to take some of that information and hopefully work it into today's presentation and just provide some from additional information. So we'll let that uh, we'll let the collecting process happen there. Um, so we'll transition over to really understanding. The, the forecasting components. What is what is the implied promise that we have? And Henry, I'll have you cover this slide in more detail. What is reality, and what is more realistic? I think with ChatGPT, everyone thinks and how easy it is to use that it's just it's going to be that's how AI is. But Chat, like as I mentioned earlier, ChatGPT and OpenAI, they've been training this model for many many years before it was actually put to production, and now we're reaping the benefits of that. So there's still a process up front that needs to go in. So it's not that easy button that Henry was mentioning earlier. So uh, Henry, it looks like the, the poll has been completed and we have mostly cash. People want to use AI to monetize as well as optimize their cash, as well as uh, demand. So demand um, forecasting and capacity utilization. So those are kind of the, the top three that we see. So if there's ways for us to, to work to cash, uh, demand and capacity utilization into the presentation, that would be wonderful. But I'll let you kind of cover this slide because I think this is extremely important for the broader uh, group to understand is what, what, where do I start and what's more realistic and how do I get to this point of being able to introduce AI into my firm? Yeah, so with forecasting, you just want to start with something that uh, has promise, right? Something that, that will work. So if you had a magic spreadsheet or something um, that's AI powered, in this case, I, I have an example that, that I'll show you in a later slide. Um, it, it, it's actually an existing solution a technology that uh, is in the lab um, and will come to, to fruition pretty soon. The, um, I think the, the most important thing to realize that is we're all on this journey together. And as you said earlier, next year, the available AIs are going to be very different than, than what, what's available now. I do think that the focus on language models um, has has overtaken um, most of the dialogue, right? So if you dial back a few years, uh, machine learning and, and deep learning for mathematical things, like the problems that we're talking about, um, those those were um, high, um, they were in high attention, but the AI world only had so much attention. Now AI has all this attention everywhere and it's all about language models. So it might be time to dial it back a little bit and talk about um, practical type solutions. So I'm going to cover these three columns here. Uh, and Mike, you can interrupt me at any time because I know I tend to talk on about these things. Um, I talked earlier about not, not taking institutional knowledge and trying to supplant it with an AI. Okay, so that's the implied promise a lot of times. And even if it's not said explicitly is, hey, we're an AI company, we can come in, replace everything you do and it'll work, right? That's a little bit too ambitious, I think, for forecasting. The reality is you can get some okay forecasting. Right? And so here you have to decide whether whether you want to um, uh, pay a certain amount to have a forecast done. Um, you know, you get some convenience and you get a certain um, a certain level of forecasting. Um, and if that's worth it for you, then then go for it. Right. What we're suggesting is there you can improve your forecast. And if you set if you set the improvement as the goal and not the supplant and start from zero, you might get a little bit further because then you'll start looking at things like, okay, well, the machine gives me three things, right? It gives me a container where I can put things that are known by contract. So I've got uh, maybe a 10-year bond that for the last eight years, I've been making payments every six months, right? So semi-annual payments. Um, but if I don't tell the machine anything further than that, and I give it eight years of data without the balloon payment, um, it's going to tell me that in year 11, I still have that payment. Right, but so an example of institutional knowledge. I know that in year ten, I have to. I'm going to refi this thing at current rates, and I have to make the balloon payment. And the payments are going to stop on this thing, or it's going to be a different amount or different rate. So 
you, like you said, garbage in, garbage out, right? So it's not actually garbage. It's actually like pretty good data. It tells you what the payment is, but you're not going to get to the balloon payment without telling it or giving the AI a reason to come up with that, right? So that's just you've hidden data from the AI. You haven't told it to, to think that way. So um, that's probably a minor example. Um, but we, we think that the, the realistic goal here is to do something small and interesting and that works. Maybe with, with one category of data, one time series, um, start there and, and then start adding more categories and, and getting more ambitious as, as you get it working, right? So that, that's sort of a, a micro approach to, to hit the macro eventually, right? You can start from the top down and start with ChatGPT and ask it about gold prices and try to go back. I think you'll find that it's going to be speculative either way and your chances are 50-50, right? Um, anyway, I'm going to upset a lot of people talking about gold. So... If we talk about, if, yeah, so if we talk about the implied promise of integration, um, you know, you hear, okay, we're going to fully, fully integrate everything. Um, m like a lot of vendors will say that, and I've been guilty of, of saying that before. Okay, so you are going to have a lot of contributing data to your forecast, and a lot of that will be messy data. And there's going to be this data that you wish you could put in there, but it's not structured right. Um, so the good news is it's actually easier then you might think to get that data into, uh, I'll call it an AI module or forecasting module, but it's also harder. Okay. It's, it's harder because if you have, okay, I've got this weekly data and I've got this daily data, I want to blend it. Okay. But I'm unwilling to take averages and, and I don't want to stretch this to my one day data to make assumptions of, okay, well, you got to work through all that. Right. And, and you end up with an ontology of acceptable quantities and then when you have those quantities, then you can use them, right? But there, you're knowingly putting in data that you're like, okay, I'm going to train the AI or I'm going to train a deep learning model on on this data, which I know the nature of because I've I've gone through it. I've done the hard work of understanding it. So now I know what the nature of my output's going to be. Um, this idea that um, integrating is okay. I have a I'm a vendor. I have a system. Just put all the data in my system on my terms, right? Like here's a here's a 10 field spec. Fill it all in. Put it in. Now you're integrated. <laughs> well, there's work there, right? That's not fully integrated. That's like shifting everything to your system. And I, the reason I really like Actaris is because this flexibility remains while you have a front end. You can do the right back things. It performs, um, and it's it's based on Azure technologies, right? Which are, are super common and um, they're they're very robust and strong. Like I use Azure every day. Uh, what's more realistic here is dispense with the integration and concentrate on the problem, right? So if you can, in a very messy way, get informative data that you want to test uh, forecast on, do that first, right? Get the data any way you can, right? Keep in mind how you shaped it to use and to inform and train the AI, but just go get it first and see if there's even a workable result. If you get all your data and you say, okay, well, it's not really predictable, then end of story. But if you, if you can get data from 10 different sources and it's really hard over six weeks and you discover that, wow, you know, I'm, I'm in a 95%, a 90% confidence interval most of the time that that's probably worth pursuing because the value of something like demand forecasting is going to set the tone for your profits. And so it's, it's this idea of taking real life things that will actually work that you can implement and doing it in a micro way using lots of data or a little bit of data because there are techniques that you can use to get big data results with small data we talk about that all the time um okay so that's enough with this point i'm on i'm on point six of nine and i can see the clock here <laughs> yeah we got we have six minutes left but you, you make a, you make a valid point right henry because it comes down to a lot of factors that uh people just need to consider and vendors like X Terrace are out there to make things a lot easier. But again, it's not that easy button. There's still work that's involved. You still need to train it based on your infrastructure. We just make it easier by putting all this mathematical information together that we know is consistent and accurate. And now marry that up with your inconsistent or unstructured components that are part of your business. So do we, let's let's just if we've only got six minutes left, let's do less than a minute a slide and we'll we'll go back to the yeah, let's we'll, uh yeah, let's skip this part and then we'll go right to the next. Okay. Okay. So this is this is a screenshot from uh, it's courtesy Dr. Jason Fiega of NCube, and this is in the lab right now. And the primary thing to take away from this is, but it, when I say in the lab, I mean these adding features. This thing actually works, and and we've tested it against um, open source systems like Profit. Um, Profit is a open open source now um, for uh, many years. It was originally made by the Facebook team. And it was pretty good at seasonality and, and um, 
actually a lot of companies use it to do forecasting and um, it might do a fine job. I think in, in the field that you and I are from, uh, it probably won't be uh, without just coming right out of the box. It's not going to be as good as this one. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say it. Um, so the screenshot that you're seeing, there's, there's a few elements here that I'm going to dial in on, but basically the time series at the top, the data is profiled. And then uh, if you look at the panel below, that's an error chart where one line is, um, it, it sort of reflects different models. But the key ingredient here is, even though there's lots of models out there that might use things like uh, auto regression, uh, moving averages, trend analysis, um, there's, there's seasonality that's considered. And uh, in this case, we threw in special dates. So things like holidays or um, you know Thanksgiving might concentrate things. They might move move money to the next day or the prior day. Like there's all sorts of conventions that might uh, concentrate certain days and then lower other days in, in distribution. But um, what this graph on the on the side now on the left bottom shows you is uh, the resulting models of running on this data profile, um, and then you can pick a model. But there, there's also there's an intelligence built in to to pick the right model at the right time, right? If that makes sense. So most most of the pro I haven't seen another, another product do it this way. This is why I really like this one. And then in the lower right panel, there's attributes like lags and um, other patterns that are detected. So there's quantities that that tell you about the profile of your data, and then um, you, you can start predicting. Okay, let's do the next slide. I know. I've, Spent a lot of time on that one. No, this this is good. But one comment I want to make on this: what we're doing right now is we're opening up the hood. This is not the end user experience. These are the results that are going to be pushed into the end user experience, where you're going to be able to see this on a weekly basis by your organization, however you're slicing and dicing your data today. But this goes back to the concept of training and making sure that the accuracy of your training is working and that you're validating this and there's not that, that error curve, you're reducing that error curve. So this is important to note that this isn't the end result of what a consumer or end user is going to look at. This yeah. is more about the training element and how do we get to those results. The, the, yeah, this is just one way of seeing it. Okay, so y you can control the confidence interval that, that you, you want. If you want 90%, you're going to have a certain range. If you if you make it really strict, the higher you pump it, the the larger the range you're going to have to forecast, right? Because it has to accommodate for error. That's the real point of this. But you can tune it, right? So you can say, I want 85 is good enough or 90 is good enough. And it'll do certain things for validation. And it'll pick um, certain methods to do things like avoid, escape local minima, you know. <laughs> but OK, let's, let's skip on to the next slide. I know I'm getting technical there. Um, this is important. Calculated lags and weights. So implied in your data profile, um, with respect to forecasting, there's going to be certain weights that you put on. There, there's going to be certain dominant terms, right? Like you might have a certain source of cash that's overwhelming all others, except for within some season. Things like this. These are detected in your data profile, and um, we actually explicitly show them. It, even if you're not interested, this helps you escape the idea of black boxing it, right? So if I do a forecast, if I'm a vendor and I say, okay, you pass our, you pass your data into our solution, which is a black box, and then you get what comes out. But it's proprietary. I can't tell you anything that happens in between. That's not what this is. This actually shows you, that, you know, as a profile of your data, this is what we're working with. And then the left hand, uh, the lower left hand pane actually allows you to select the model that you use to predict. But anyway, let's let's <laughs> move on to the next slide here because I'm racing the clock here. Um, okay. Also very important. Um, you'll hear terms like RMSE. Uh, which anybody who's uh, you know worked with regression models, what you want to do is you want to minimize the distance between your actual and your forecast. Right, the lower the error, the better. Generally, up to a certain point, you might overtrain it. So if you're getting a perfect result every time, that's overtrained and that's rote memory. You don't want to do that. The idea is we've built in this auto. Dr. Figo has built in this auto tuning uh, capability where. Uh, there's methods that are applied to minimize this error automatically. It's not something that you have to do. Like a typical data science team will have to go through this, um, and at great expense, they have to do this tuning. Anyway, let's. Um, so more on that. Uh, well, follow up. Yeah. Well, now this is this has obviously been a great conversation, but I definitely want to skip forward to um, the challenge. Right. We we mentioned earlier in today's discussion. Uh, there's a lot of, of topics that we can go through. We wanted to make sure that we covered more of the real life use cases that we have seen AI being used for. Now we've opened up the hood of how this is actually working behind the scenes and more of an open source model, not a black box model. And the importance of training that model with your data and other data elements. But what we want to encourage everyone to do today is if you're watching this, you know, send us your unique data set. 
And what we'll do is we'll run it through the forecasting engine that has been created by the team and provide you the results. And then from there, you can take those results and you can see how it does it align to your forecast. I would encourage you to use historical data just so you can see the comparison of what your actual was, your budget was for that time period. And then the predicted forecast to see the accuracy that we can get to. And then, of course, knowing that there's going to be some fine tuning in there. But it's a good jump start. We all, when ChatGPT came out, we're like, eh, this is okay. But now most of us probably have it on a third monitor. And that third monitor isn't going to go away anytime soon. So the idea is to get to walk, or excuse me, crawl, walk, run. So give us some, some of your data if you feel comfortable. We're happy running this through our AI algorithm and, and the AI model that we have on, on, on uh, in the platform and then be able to generate the results and give it to you. So if you want, um, oops, so I don't have that in my slide deck, unfortunately, so I apologize. Uh, the address that you can send this to is going to be sales at ecteris.com. So if you have your data set in, in a certain Excel format would be the easiest for us to view, send it to sales.ecteris.com. Go ahead, Henry. Yeah, so the format, you just want to have a date in one column and a quantity in the other column. And that's all we need. Yeah. Oh, um, and also specify what the cadence, or sorry, what the interval is. If it's a week, you know, say it's a week. If it's a day, say it's a day. If it's a month. If it's a quarter. Uh, that's very important because your prediction will come out in the same in the same interval. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Henry, for for joining. This is always a great topic, and I know it's, we're going to have multiple multiple sessions on this and dive a little bit deeper, and also bring in more use cases, demonstrations of this technology. So, if you have any questions. Please feel free to reach out to us. We're, we're always happy to talk about AI and how it applies to your business and how we can make your life easier. So thank you, everyone, for joining today. And thank you again, Henry, for joining as well. Thanks, Mike. All right. Take care, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everybody.